Hello, you're James Gershner. So you're a professor of urban planetary science at the University of California, Berkeley, until recently. And since 2007, you're director of the Swiss Federal Institute of Forest, Snow and Landscape Research and also professor of physics of environmental systems at the ETH Zurich. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your field of research, actually? I work on a wide range of topics, basically concerned with how physics, chemistry and biology interact to shape the surface of the Earth. Um, when people ask me, what do you work on, I say, if it happens within 10 meters below the surface or 10 meters above the surface, I'm probably interested in one way or another in it. Um, in terms of traditional scientific fields, I work in hydrology, geochemistry, and geomorphology. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm interested in, for example, how catchments store rainfall and then release it as stream flow, how the chemistry of rainfall is altered as water flows through the subsurface on its way from being rainfall to being stream flow, um, or how soils evolve on the Earth's surface and how the Earth's surface topography itself evolves over time. Okay. Questions like that. Okay. So in your career, um, you've been to different places and seen a lot. Um, what have you found the most exciting? Well, hmm. first and foremost I'd say the greatest reward of a life in science is the amazing people you get to meet along the way. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get to meet people with just amazing intellectual capabilities, with these incredible minds, and they also tend to be a very diverse, colorful, interesting bunch of people as well. So, so sort of getting to know them as people mm -hmm. has been just an incredibly rewarding thing. Um, secondly, the opportunity to go to amazing places around the world and to do so not just as a tourist to come and take pictures and leave but with actually a purpose to work there to understand something about that particular place um, potentially to help other people to um, solve a problem or something like that mm -hmm. um, yeah. so so those things have been incredibly rewarding and then of course for anyone who's intellectually inclined, there's nothing more interesting than a cool puzzle to work on. And there are times when you're focused on solving a problem, um, the rest of the world just sort of disappears from your consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and you become completely absorbed, and once in a while you actually solve the thing. And that can be just um, a remarkable sort of experience. To discover something that no one else has known before. Not just to discover something you didn't know before, mm -hmm. which is cool enough, mm -hmm. but to discover something no one else in the history of the world has ever known. Quite right? fulfilling. That's, that's a very special thing. Yes. And, um, you know, in a career in science, you might, if you're very lucky, get that experience once or twice or three times. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a remarkable thing when you experience it. Okay. So what did you least enjoy in your career? Hmm. Well, I will say, I think for everybody, uh, the process of getting tenure at a university is no picnic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I suppose for a few lucky and or gifted individuals, um, it turns out to be entirely straightforward. But I think for most people, um, it's a bit of a struggle and there's quite a bit of anxiety involved. Um, so that's, that's certainly no fun. Um, the struggle for resources to support interesting science, I think, um, is another thing that has been difficult and has, is becoming more difficult over time as basically uh, most fields become more and more crowded with people who would of course be interested in also having a life in science. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So so I think those things have certainly been been somewhat difficult and, and 
that's to be expected, I think. Uh -huh. um, if, you're, if you're asking for public funds to support um, your own intellectual curiosity, um, then you should expect that you have to make a good case for that. Yes. Um, yes. And that lots of other people will be trying to do the same thing. Mm. Okay. So, talking a little bit about future directions, uh, what would you do if you still had another 40 years to go? And I hope you do. <laughs> well, 40 years from now, I'll be 92. Um, would be very nice if I'm still active in science. I know people who have done it. Um, um, we will see if I'm so lucky. Um, but I would say some of the areas that I'm interested in looking at um, going forward are, of course, within the broad sphere of the things I've been describing, um, there's a general class of problems which asks the question, how can we understand the behavior of heterogeneous, spatially and mechanistically complex systems when we may not know all the details about how all the components work? Mm -hmm. um, so understanding how water flows through the subsurface and how chemical reactions shape the water that drains from a piece of the landscape at the detailed mechanistic level is almost unbelievably complex. But the overall behavior of the system is somewhat simpler than you might naively expect. And so we need tools for understanding how these complex systems behave at the scale of the whole system without needing to be able to do the forward problem from scratch at the micron scale. Okay. and then simply aggregate upwards. Um, and there's a, a very broad class of problems that, that work like that. Okay. Um, uh, and so I'm very interested in those kinds of things. I'm very interested in uh, problems like how does the Earth's surface fall apart? Mm -hmm. How, what, what controls the uh, strength and the resistance to erosion of um, say, a plot of land on a hillside or an entire mountainside itself. Mm -hmm. um, how do landslides happen? How do debris flows happen? How do rock falls happen? Um, what determines how far they go? Things like that. Okay. Um, that's another sort of interesting problem about a complex heterogeneous material that is also hard to characterize, but for which we need practical answers so that people can decide how to handle these sorts of issues. Okay. I live and work in Switzerland, and half the country of Switzerland would be uninhabitable if you couldn't successfully manage the risks of living in steep mountainous regions. Yes. That's part of the work of our institute, yes. and um, it is also, besides being a practical issue, an intellectually fascinating exercise as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Talking uh, about the young researchers nowadays, mm. what advice would you give them? Um, first and foremost, hang on to your curiosity. Um, the, it's easy to get bogged down in the details of uh, and the anxieties of trying to have a career in science mm -hmm. and worrying about, you know, will I get a permanent position here or there and uh, will I be able to get this grant or that grant and so on. Um, those are practical realities, but probably the way to carry yourself through all of that is to stay curious and stay excited about the same things that brought you into science in the first place. Mm. Um, so if you can hang on to that sense of enthusiasm, um, that will help a lot. Do, do work that excites you, and most of the other problems will in time take care of themselves. Um, but if you do boring, tedious work just because you can get support for boring, tedious work, mm -hmm. um, you'll have a boring, tedious career, no matter how surficially successful it might be. That would be the first and foremost advice I would give to people. Okay, great. 
Well, thank you very much for your time, James. It's a pleasure talking with you. Thank you.